Austin is present. Um, and uh, Xander, can you uh, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you very thank you very much. And we're pleased to be joined by Craig DiCarlo from Colliers and uh, by um, Angela Mills. Okay, and we have three. Uh, at this point, three attendees, uh, thank you very much for coming. The first order of business is the approval of minutes of April 12th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So I'll moved. Oh. Second. Thank, thank you so much. So uh, corrections uh, of the minutes. Okay. I'm going to ask you to signify your approval of the minutes by saying um, that you approve or yes, George. Approve. Thank you very much, Christine. Approve. Thank you, Alex. Yes. Thank you, Sean. Yes. Anika. Yes. Uh, Xander. Yes. Thank you, Sharon. Yes. And Austin votes yes. The next item on our agenda is the financial update from uh, Sean. Thanks, Austin. So I think um, for the financial update, we were going to actually turn it over to um, Collier's. Uh, Craig, we were thinking that you would um, just give an update of the, the estimate that we received, the, the updated cost estimate. Yep. Thank you, Sean. Um, so what we had was a cost estimate from 2020. Previously, that was the most recent cost estimate. Um, and that was you know, for these schematic design level drawings that uh, Feingold Alexander had produced at the time. Uh, that came in at um, $24.8 million construction cost. Um, as we know, time has passed. We've been about two years since that cost estimate was done. Uh, so we sent it to sent the same information to the cost estimator and asked them um, to give us an update, basically, so to bring it to modern day understanding of things. And so we did. Uh, that was received recently, um, and the construction cost estimate has increased to 30.3 million. Um, so that's a five and a half or six million dollar increase over those past two years. Um, you know, at first blush, that's um, pretty dramatic, but um, that is sort of the market that we're in that's consistent with what we've been seeing on other projects. So although a little alarming, um, it is, we do think it's a reality. That being said, uh, there are because the design drawings are so early um, and so um, let's say not fully developed, there are a lot of assumptions baked into that cost estimate, a construction cost estimate. And within those assumptions, there are opportunities to um, adjust to modify what the eventual building will cost. Um, just a high, high level recap. So right now they're looking at um, or estimating $411 per square foot for the renovation portion of the work and five, approximately $512 per square foot for the new construction work. Um, and, you know, if we looked at that a couple of years ago, we would say, well, that's just crazy high, but the market has, you know, moved that in that direction over the last couple, uh, even the last couple months. So, um, I guess one other thing I like to point out is they are including escalation. So there is a, a seven point eight percent escalation from now until when construction is anticipated to start. That is something that may happen or may not happen, um, depending on what the market does. There's also a ten percent design contingency built into that. And what that represents are things that the uh, our value that the estimator um, is just just guessing, holding a, putting a placeholder in as the design develops. They're assuming that there are things that have not been included now, and then once that's been determined by the design and, and you guys, that ten percent will slowly uh, be reduced in subsequent cost estimates until. Um, at bid time, there's a zero zero percent design contingency. So those are just some of the things um, that I wanted to point out, sort of high level stuff. Um, and then I'll open it up to questions or other comments. Great, Sean. 
Craig, do you think, um, based on what you're seeing in the market, this captures the worst of what's going on in the market? Or do you think there's potential we get another cost estimate in 12 months or um, six months from now? I'm not sure when the next one would be due and and we see it's gone up again. Do you, do you think this captures sort of the worst of the worst of the cost escalation that's been going on out there? So cost escalation is, is tough to predict. It's notorious. <laughs> um, but what I think that the cost estimate includes right now is a conservative understanding of where things are. Um, so only time will tell if the market continues to increase. Um, it's anyone's guess whether it does or not. My personal belief is that you know at some point uh, it, it won't continue at this kind of breakneck pace of escalation and inflation. Um, but you know, I'm sort of an optimist. So what the cost estimator included, uh, you know, the 7.8% escalation to me seems like, uh, especially compared with other cost estimates for other projects, that's on the conservative side. So I think it would, to sort of use your terms, kind of worst case scenario. But uh, with that big asterisk, nobody knows uh, Thank you. what things will look like in, in a year. Other questions about the uh, new cost estimate? Anika has her hand up. Thank you. Anika? Uh, this may have just been clarified. My volume went out as you started speaking, Craig. Did you say that the overall um, the estimated increase was 7.8%? No, so that 7.8% is um, the assumed escalation in cost between today and when we're going to start construction, which is next summer. So up until now, you know, escalation has uh, been very rapid. Uh, historically, it's somewhere in the 4%, 5% range. Um, last year was something like 9%. So, you know, kind of unheard of. Where everyone's kind of looking to the future saying, okay, will that continue? Um, is it going to taper off? I think everybody assumes it's going to taper off at some point, but no one really knows exactly where. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, uh, Anika, thank you for the question. I, I just want to make sure I understand what your response is. So if we were to break ground today, uh, my understanding you to be saying that their cost estimate would be 30 million, whatever it is, minus 7.8%. Yes. OK, so the idea is that between now and the time that we anticipate breaking ground, they've built in this cost es escalator. OK, that's, that's right. Great. And I think that that's a practice um, commonly done in order to, I think, avoid that situation that Sean was referring to earlier, whereas, you know, a year from now or, you know, a couple of months from now, you get another cost estimate. It's like, you know, the market always goes up. Right. And so the cost estimators try to predict what things going to, how that's going to change in the future so that you're looking at uh, what it's, you know, ideally the bids that you're going to get uh, a year from now. Right. Alex? Sorry, I'm having to switch over. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> My husband just came home, so I had to switch earbuds. Um, so I... Um, I watched the design subcommittee meeting where there was a little bit of conversation about timeline. And I guess from an outreach perspective, I'm trying to sort of get my arms around um, pre this point, there were sort of, you know, three main things that couldn't change because of the MBLC, which was, you know, the building program, you know, the approximate square footage and the location. And we have a schematic design and have spent a certain amount with the architects. And um, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of looking at the cost escalation that we're looking at, does that change sort of feedback from the community? I mean, like in theory, we could start over with a new design as long as we met the building program and the square footage, but to the extent that we already have a design, <clears throat> You know, relatively speaking, like the massing, the the general overall exterior kind of thing. Um, I guess I'm just trying to figure out, like, because of these cost escalations, does it change sort of either the timeline that we have in terms of 
the project or does it uh, make us lean toward the schematics in one way or another? I, I'm just trying to understand sort of what it means. Uh, Craig? Sure. Um, so as far as the timeline, I would say this doesn't change anything. So, you know, um, the, I actually had recently put together uh, a graphic on the schedule, which I think we can, I can hopefully share later with you guys um, or share with the public. The, and that builds in a certain amount of time for the designers to do their thing and then uh, time for construction. I don't think we can um, speed that up very much. And, you know, the other option then would be to kind of push it out but pushing it out is only going to exacerbate things because even though we're in a period of great inflation and great escalation, I don't think anyone pre predicts that it's going to go down. So each month that goes by or each year that goes by for the amount of money you guys have, you're going to get less and less building. So just sort of waiting, kind of holding on to that money and all right, let's see what happens a year from now is not a good strategy. So I think the, the timeline is, um, you know, as quick as we can, can move and get the project going, the better off the town's going to be, the more you're going to get for your dollar. Um, and oh, then, I'm, sorry. It, Craig, I think that the other part of Alex's question is not just about time. So yeah. Feingold Alexander is uh, now going to be uh, beginning the work of revising the schematics informed by a uh, substantial public outreach effort. I think what Alex was saying is that in terms of what we're saying to the public, is it reasonable to continue to go forward with the schematics that we've had and say, well, this is, you know, these are the schematics. We're going to be working off of these to further develop them. Are they reliable in that sense, given this uh, cost cost uh, escalation um, issue? Yes, I think the idea is um, the you know, and we've tried to frame you know the the, the public outreach that um, if someone we're not looking, uh, let me how, how to phrase it. If someone were to say, oh, we should add uh, an even larger area to the library, I think that would be something that we would have to say no to, even, even before kind of this latest cost estimate. Um, so th those types of comments would be kind of out of bounds or off, you know, an easy no. Um, there are other things, uh, materiality, which I think is still um, open for public comment. But if the public comment is we want, say, um, you know, a copper skin uh, you know, real copper, that's a very expensive product, we might have to say on the design side, well, we can give you the look for look of copper with this more cost effective product. Um, so those types of comments are still welcome, but how you decide to, and the design team decides to respond to them might be, okay, we can give you that, but we've got to be cost effective about it. And, and there, there's always, on every project, there's always that balance between um, how much, you know, what you want the building to be and then how much it costs. And um, so I think on this project, there'll be no different. Um, we'll still be, that public input will still be impactful, but um, there will be some things that, you know, the, the, the town or the, the, the building committee will have to say no to just because uh, we're constrained by costs. But it is reliable for Alex on the 1st of May and the outreach subcommittee to present to the public the existing schematics. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Christine. So coming at it from the design subcommittee. Um, so I noticed, you know, it says that it's already you know, doom and gloom, like $6 million going to cost more. And I noticed in the report, they suggest alternative one. And then I was like, oh, are there more alternatives? But there was only one. And it was, um, you know, wood structure instead of steel makes sense. And it was like a half million dollar savings. So I'm thinking, oh, six, that's a half. 
So will there be more alternatives that come and are they delivered to us sort of that way? And so when they come to the design subcommittee, um, how are we gonna get those? How are we expected to weigh in on those? And um, I also sort of remember at the last meeting, FAA talking about like eight weeks for schematic. Again, it's that timeline thing. Um, so how, that just sounds like tomorrow, but so how is this all gonna work? Certainly, uh, Austin. If that you was a lot, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best, Austin. With your permission, I'll, I'll I'll take a crack at that. I I we are we are waiting with as we said bated breath, Craig. So, so um, the first part of the question, uh, Christine, was um, about the that alternate one doing timber instead of st typical steel construction. And that is a below the line alternate. So what that means is that 30.3 million construction costs did not include that. So we'd actually, if you if we do go the route of timber, now we're at 30.8 million. And so, you know, that, that, that would be one that we'd have to think long and hard about what else is the town willing to give up in order to go with the timber frame uh, construction. Um, with the, topic are uh, talking about um, the schematic design process being eight weeks. So that's eight weeks that hasn't started yet. So what um, we, we actually, we've had a couple recent discussions with, uh, with Sharon and we had one uh, with uh, M MBLC today um, talking about kind of big concept program uh, questions and um, Fine Gold Alexander is looking to get direction on, on those various things before they start that eight week clock and then the eight week clock, yes, will be very, will be, you know, go by quickly, but um, there'll be uh, lots of meetings and opportunities to talk about um, the various decisions that, that can be made. Um, getting back to sort of the cost question. Yes, there will be lots of different ideas that, that Fine Gold Alexander will provide uh, ways to reduce the cost of the, of the project. Um, so, they're aware of that cost estimate. They've taken a look at it as well. They're already, they've got the gears turning. What, you know, how can we be creative or how, how can they be creative to give you guys um, all alternatives to reduce the, the overall project cost? And then in the end, if uh, we find that, because there'll be a number of cost estimates that we do between now and when the project goes out to bid, uh, the idea is we're, we're each step, we're getting more definition more um, certainty on how the building is going together and a better understanding, sort of a sharpening of the pencil of how much things are gonna cost. And then each step of the way, if we say, oh, we're, we're still, uh, our cost estimate is exceeding our budget for construction. Let's put the thinking cap on, what else can we do? What else can we um, be more efficient and effective about? And um, uh, Fine Gold Alexander, not to speak for them, but they, de they did, at least earlier today, they, they expressed confidence that they could make it work, that they can give you guys a building design that's gonna fit within your budget. Um, so uh, that being said, um, the, the technical term is you know, value engineering. Um, so we'll have a, a, a series of processes where we look at the cost estimate, we look at what the building is and say, you know, where can we reduce costs? Um, so it'll be a process. Uh, there will be some difficult decisions to make, but the, the process is set up in a way that you guys will be able, will be informed along the way and have the opportunity to uh, continue to make adjustments um, as we proceed towards uh, the ultimate goal of getting the construction documents out to bid. Before calling on uh, Anika and Xander, Christine, does that, was that uh, helpful uh, to you? It, it was, and I just have one question off of it that actually doesn't go back to Craig. It kind of goes to Alex and the outreach. Um, so what I'm hearing is this is the world we're living, you know, it never enough money. So when you're soliciting the public for all of their input, you know, it's always about, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, and adding more. I hope that the public is hearing us a little about this, and they can also give us feedback on what they could live without. You know, it's not just a shopping list, but also, you know, or a prioritization of certain things are more important than other things, because it sounds like this is going to be a tremendous balance between, have, you know, 
building with the money we have and making people happy. And, and just to say out loud, uh, the public outreach process is going to be iterative. It's, it's not a one time and then hold your peace. So as the design moves forward and we're consulting with the public, we may at particular times be able to ask, here are the choices that we have and what is it that the views are. So um, Anika and then Xander and then Sean, Anika. So um, yes, in regards to uh, the outreach, I have a question looking for clarity around the concern that has been brought up by um, some community members. And that is around um, the, the teen space and that somehow is there a conflict or competition um, in regards to a larger town youth center, specifically around a, a BIPOC center. And so my understanding is that the teen space uh, was established back in 2015 in collaboration with uh, youth. And, um, and also that is required by the um, MBLC uh, approved program. So, and, and just opinion uh, based, um, you know, I'm thinking more with public libraries, it's, it's very common space to have a youth center, um, you know, a, a youth space, rather a teen space. And, um, you know, therefore if you separate or take away, you're actually limiting the options for our um, area youth. But I think that especially in regards to the, um, the upcoming outreach event, it would be nice to have clarity, especially around people that either may have, may not have been following the project or that may have slipped their mind. Um, so there's kind of not a, a, a thought out there that this, you know, teen space as it is, um, is something that had been recently included. Um, and that, you know, it actually, what, you know, we're going to, like, I always seem to think like sometimes adults, like we'll mess it up and we're really looking for like the input, um, you know, from, from the teens to give us, um, you know, examples and suggestions and thoughts about what they would like to see. Sharon, did you want to say anything in response to Anika's comment? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Anika. I love I, I love everything that you just said. I'm glad that you brought it up. It's true. It is a, a requirement as part of our project. Um, we, we can't eliminate the teen space. It is, it's, it's very much a part of public library services uh, across the country. And, um, you know, every year there's more and more information out there about how you know, teenagers are not adults and they're not children. And so they need their own spaces. And, and, um, and so teenagers are our patrons. And, and so this is a, a wonderful way of, of us being able to serve the teens. So yeah, it doesn't, um, it's completely separate from a, a, a teen community center for the town. Thank you. Oh, Xander? Um, I guess two, two things, and I don't know if this is so much a question as just me expressing my own anxiety out loud. Um, the, I mean, we're talking about, from the outreach perspective, a lot of our conversation has been, how do we include those who haven't necessarily been included in the conversation so far, um, as well as to keep engaging those who have been. Um, one thing I wanna just really be mindful of is that given this recent cost estimate that we still preserve the spirit of including new voices without just inviting them to come to cost saving meetings, if you will, because um, it's one thing to invite people to make a shopping list it's another thing to invite people once you've got too much stuff on the shopping list to just come to put things back, right? Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to say is that, I mean, we're talking about a 20% increase. Like this is 20 cents on the dollar in a town where uh, some of our contract negotiations aren't keeping up with current inflation, never mind escalation looking outwards. Um, and so 
I am curious, like, as a parent to young people who sometimes put too much stuff on their plate, there is the idea of like, well, what if you only ate this and the negotiating down of that? But at some point, you've got to say dinner time is over. And I'm just wondering, like, what is our exit plan if we can't get this back towards a budget that that is feasible? Uh, Can I add the Austin? Because my question was very similar to what Alexander um, and maybe gets to what he's asking. Sure. Um, I was going to ask along the same lines. At what point, Craig, will we know whether we can reduce 20% of construction costs and have a project that everyone's happy with? It will be at the end of schematic design where we'll see what that looks like and what strategies were deployed to reduce the cost. Um, again, to Alexander's or Xander's point, like when will we know what it looks like and then people will decide if, if this is a project we still want to um, support? May I just interrupt one sec? So I, I heard Craig say something and I just want to make sure I understood it. What Craig was saying to us is we should not overreact to this cost estimate. It would be a mistake to overreact to this cost estimate. The cost estimate will change. The cost estimate will get more accurate. I also heard Craig say that uh, Feingold Alexander is, quote, optimistic that they can make our project work. And what does that mean, make our project work? That doesn't just mean, you know, keep it within the budget and like, uh, you know, straw, and that'll be our library. Make our project work means realize the vision that the MBLC is uh, funding. So, Craig may have a different answer, but that's what I heard him saying, that we're not now in a position where, um, you know, we kind of got to run for the hills because we're $6 million over budget. Uh, we might not be $6 million over budget as the design, um, as the design gets more uh, refined. So Craig, did I, did I hear that uh, correctly? Yes, I think you did a very good job, uh, Austin, summarizing kind of my main points and, and making it very succinct. Um, there will be some tough choices that need to be made along the way, but there will be multiple opportunities to do that. And, I, and Sean, you're right. So at uh, schematic design, so later in the schematic design process, um, let's see, actually, I can't remember when the next cost estimate is, but uh, perhaps it's at halfway through DD design development, which is after schematic design. Um, that'll be another kind of point in time where we'll be able to see, all right, what steps have the design team taken to, and in the library building committee taken to um, keep the project affordable. And that's kind of like a reality check. You get another cost estimate. Um, and so then there'll be another opportunity to say, all right, those worked, but we still need to come down or, um, or yes, now we're on target. Um, so it, it will be a, a process that happens over the course of the next year. Um, at any point, if things aren't going in the right direction, um, people start feeling uncomfortable, we can have that discussion at that time and say, okay, let's take another hard look at this. Are we going down a path that is not, in the, uh, is not gonna serve the town well and then decide what to do about it? So I was, I was so with you until the last go round. Uh, and again, I just want to make sure I understand, you are an experienced person in this world. Yes, Feingold sir. Alexander is an experienced person in this world. I thought I understood you to be saying that they, perhaps you, are confident at this point. They've seen this before. This is not, a, this is not something I haven't seen. They're confident at this point that uh, we can realize the vision of the library. Uh, so I'm just myself uh, would, would not think at this point we would be talking about we're going to face some decision point at which we say, uh, oops. And uh, I just want to make sure I've got that right, that you are confident and they are confident at this point that um, 
savings can be realized, that the uh, cost estimate will get more accurate. And by the way, there's another thing which we haven't talked about, which is the possibility of raising more money. So, uh, but you are confident that those lines will intersect in a way that we will have uh, a project that realizes the vision. Yes, I think with all projects, the goal is to kind of maximize what, you, what you're getting uh, for the, the amount of money that you're spending. And this one will be no different. Um, those decision points that I was talking about are more, um, let's say micro adjustments. So the goal is, you know, a, a library that does everything that you guys want it to do and fulfills your vision and fulfills the MBLC's vision. Um, but along the way, as we're going, there, there do, there are opportunity, there will be opportunities points in time where um, you, where the design team and my office will be presenting to you guys, all right, here's a decision we need to make uh, based on the way the market's going or based on the way the design is shaping up or based on the next cost estimates. There, there may be times where we have to make, where you guys are called to make tough decisions on that balance that I was speaking of, yeah. of you know, uh, the cost of the project versus uh, you know, the quality uh, that you're getting. Right. So those were the decision points I, I was referring to. Thank you, Kurt. Sharon. Unmute. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate what and agree with what Craig said. We did meet with the MBLC this afternoon and I was a tad bit concerned over the $6 million, but they absolutely reassured me in less than a minute. Um, you know, no, listen, Sharon, this is the process. This is very normal. This is based on a set of, it's not, the, the schematics aren't even complete yet. Um, and you're a year out and there will still be more cost uh, estimates that will come out. And they said, Sharon, this is what we do. It's happening everywhere. So it's really, it calmed me down immediately. Thank you. Great. Okay. Anything else on the cost estimate? Well, thank you. And uh, thanks, Craig, for presenting it. Sean, back to you. Do we have an invoice to approve? Yes, we do. So um, we have the March invoice. I'll just put it on the screen real quick. Thank you. We have the March invoice from um, Collier's. And there's a breakdown of services that were performed during the month. And again, it's it's sort of a a um, recurring uh, amount each month. So it's roughly $10,978 uh, $10, per month. So this would be the second month we're uh, approving. Great. And uh, Sean, do you want to move that we approve sure. the payment of the invoice? Yeah, I move that we approve payment for the March invoice to Collier's. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, are there any questions about the invoice? Okay, Sean, if you could just not, if you could take it off the screen share for a minute. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to you approve the uh, recommendation to pay the invoice. You do not, George. Approve. Christine. Approve. Thank you, Alex. Yes. Sean. Approve. Sharon. Yes. Anika. Yes. Xander. Yeah. And uh, Austin says, yes. Okay, thank you so much. All right, next item on the agenda is more from Collier's. You're muted, Craig. Is that the schedule item? So next on the agenda is project schedule and interim locations, the, the, the things that are there month to month, I mean, we uh, needing to meet. Fantastic, okay. so. Uh, it if, with your permission, I'll share my screen and I'll quickly go through our uh, schedule. Thank you. Let's maximize it so we can see as best we can. All right. Can you guys see that? Oh, no, you can't. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah. All right. So um, here's the, the latest schedule graphic. On the left-hand side, we've got the various phases. Um, 
I'll get to this in a moment, the public commentary. Right. So the design phase is what we're currently in. After that comes bidding, after that construction, and then things like move in and <sighs> occupancy, and then finally close out. So those are our col that's our first column. Across the top, we have uh, the years, um, the months and year. So this actually should say, instead of timeline description, it should say timeline description 2022, which is the, the where we are. I'll add on for our next update, I'll add on a red line that shows where we are in that process and it will track across um, each month with my report. Uh, we go out through 2023, 2024 is condensed down. The only thing happening then is, is construction. And then 2025 is when we wrap things up. So as I was mentioning earlier in this blue row here, we're in the design phase. We're just about to begin that schematic design, SD phase. Um, all, so now getting to this pu public commentary, yeah. something that we had talked about at the last meeting was showing uh, a visual to help everyone understand kind of when that public commentary would be most impactful. So right now, or you know, beginning any day now, once we start schematic design, we are in the period of greatest overall project, greatest impact to the overall project. Yeah. Um, the sooner the comments come in and are evaluated, um, the better, because that allows the design team to incorporate them into the, the, the foundations of the project. Then once we get to design development, we're, we can still accept uh, public comment. It still will have an impact, but now it'll be more about sort of the color selections, the interior materials, kind of the look and feel stuff. And then we've got this, this sloping off. So as we move through design development phase, by the time we get about halfway through design development, the time where public comment will have the most impact will be over. Um, I do think there is a value to continuing to solicit public comment um, because a term I was use, using earlier, sort of those micro adjustments, micro adjustments will still be possible sort of in the, in the design phase. Once we get to construction documents, that's CD phase, at that point, public comments will not have uh, much of an impact at all. The construction document phase is a time when Feingold Alexander takes all the information they learned over the previous, uh, let's say, um, eight months and then starts putting them into uh, a format that can be put out to bid. And so it's really a documentation phase and no longer a design phase, even though it's considered part of the design period. Um, up top here, um, I've put in a, a small graphic for the five anticipated uh, MBLC uh, grant disbursements. Um, the MBLC um, has criteria for each one of these disbursements. And so based on a, a more detailed schedule, which we developed in order to create this graphic, um, these are the times, you know, this upcoming summer, next summer, the summer of 2024 and then two in 2025 sort of at the end of construction once the building has been occupied and then once all the closeout is done um, that final 20 percent uh, fifth disbursement so that's where we are great so questions to craig about the schedule i'm looking to see if any, uh, alex yeah, thanks, Craig. This is actually super helpful. So um, I guess the thing that I want to make sure of, so we have our May 1st event, which is in the library, and the plan right now is um, uh, the town is working um, through uh, the Crest Director and through the CPOs um, on summer events out in the various apartment complexes. And so for us, that was an opportunity that we were looking at sort of taking our show on the road and really getting out to the communities who may not otherwise have opportunities to you know, come uh, and, and give their, their feedback. And those are scheduled over the summer. We don't have the dates yet. I don't know if Angela knows what those dates yet. Um, Angela wasn't the one working on it, but um, so our, our plan was to take sort of the the bulk of, of going out, which I think is really important in the summer. And it 
looks like that's still okay based on, on this chart. And I just want to make sure that's the case. Correct. Yes, that is the case. So okay. information collected in the summer will still have a, a, a good impact, a strong impact on the design process. So, so through mid July, is that the way I'm in my inter like, like for, for me, I just want to have like yep. a, a date, like how many can we get in by X date to make sure that we're, you know, able to get the design team and the feedback that they need. Yep. I, I would say if you're looking for kind of a, a, a target, I would say, you know, that uh, 4th of July weekend, everything you get in before the 4th of July will be most helpful. Um, and then after that break, then we'll start um, focusing more on interior um, elements and less about the overall project. And can I ask a clarifying sure. question? So, um, uh, never mind. I think I'm good. <laughs> Could I just say, and again, I, I know this is not the desirable thing. But it is right, Craig, it's all also always possible, not desirable. If we were not ready to say to Feingold Alexander, you got to slow down. We need another two weeks or three weeks to solicit comments and digest them. Not desirable, but possible. Is that right? I would recommend strongly against it just because, uh, as I was saying earlier, you know, time yeah. is money in the construction industry, yeah. especially uh, in, in the environment we're in with uh, high escalation. But also, the, you know, Fine Gold Alexander, their time is money as well. So, yes, yeah. okay. while it would be possible to say, hey, we yeah. need to, to hit the brakes a little bit, we want some more time to design uh, or incorporate ideas. Um, there would be a dollar cost associated with it. And by the way, public comment also means us, doesn't it? Certainly. Right. So what, what we're looking at is not only for the, the kind of outreach that we're, uh, we're, we're going to undertake, but for us. So we've got to digest it and be able to give them our reactions. Christine. Um, so with that i heard beginning of july but that public comment or these comments and thoughts have to be compiled and then i'm assuming sent to like the design subcommittee who have to absorb it or do something with it and then recommendations have to be made to the building um committee as a whole so all that does also take time um so i'm i'm sticking with it it's still you know ideally beginning of July that outreach sort of starts slowing down or can deliver all their comments. Um, and and I, I kind of agree. I mean, Austin, I, I think you always can, you know, things happen, but I think we need to be cautious and when we use that break and, and slow things down or ask for more time. I, I think it, we really have to almost pretend, I think that that isn't the happen and if it has to it has to but time is money and when you start messing with the schedule it starts affecting so many things supplies um money um so i think we need to do what we're doing plan and due diligence try to right. get a really smart way to handle this and smooth you know as smoothly as we can um process all this great thank you christine other questions about the schedule uh, just want to make sure I'm seeing everybody. Okay, I do not see any. Uh, Christine, are you? Uh, do you have another question? I just have one. Sure. Does the bid process phase have to be that long? Like, so where we were talking about where are there areas that have a little bit of adjustment that maybe can, you know? So, Craig, where where are there little areas that maybe could shrink? Or so grow? the 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 three months is kind of a rule of thumb. Um, it, it's, there may be the opportunity to shave a week or two out of that, but that's not only um, putting the bids out um, to the pub, uh, to the to contractors, but that's also time for you guys to evaluate the bids um, and, and then award a bid, uh, award it to a, a particular contractor. So that's all <coughs> in, to, in that phase. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Okay, other thoughts about the schedule, the questions about the schedule. 
Okay, I, I am not seeing anyone's hand. Okay, Craig, if you could take down the schedule, thank you so much. Uh, is there anything to be said about the identification of the interim location? Um, that we have not um, spent much of our time in the last, say, two weeks uh, on that, but that is something that we'll um, right. begin, begin working on uh, soon. And soon means roughly when? So now that we've kind of hammered out the, so that we've got this information on the yep. cost, we've hammered out the schedule, there are, um, that is something we can now start looking at uh, with, with more intensity. Great. George? This actually goes back to the schedule question because I knew we were going to talk about interim locations, but at what point, uh, at what point do we commit to spaces? Does that happen before the bidding process? And we just, if we don't get award a bid, we just don't use the spaces or at what point do we have to commit to those offsite locations? So um, I have on my detailed schedule uh, an assumption about when we would have a, a, a location selected because presumably there'll be some work that needs to be done at that location to prepare it. There'll be a, a big move effort um, to bring a portion or as much of the um, collection as possible over, get everything set up. So that I don't have it off the top of my head, but yes, there is a there is sort of a date when we would need to have that the location selected so that we can do all those other preparatory things in time for uh, us to uh, clear out the existing building so that the, con the contractor can be begin their work. So, um, but that's something I'll look into for the next meeting is uh, give you guys a, a, a time frame when when we, we've got to have those decisions made. Terrific, thanks, Alex. Yeah, um, so for the temporary location slash temporary services, is there a timeline? We had talked about getting public input around, you know, sort of priorities while the building is closed. So is there a time frame by which if we're going to ask the public questions or include that as part of our outreach, is there a time by which we need to have that information? Craig? Uh, yes. Um, so I'll sort of block that out as part of my um, sort of sub schedule for that temporary location. I'll block out uh, sort of the ideal time to get input for that. Great. And we'll, that'll uh, you'll bring that to the committee in our next meeting in two weeks. Yes. OK, thank you. OK, other questions about the interim locations? Okay, Craig, thank you very much. Uh, next are our subcommittee reports. Christine from the design subcommittee. Okay, so we had our first meeting um, a couple weeks ago on the 15th and uh, it ended up being kind of a meet and greet for the most part with Feingold Alexander who um, came and was on the Zoom with us, the project manager, uh, Ellen Anselone was there and her assistant Josephine and uh, one of Jim Alexander, one of the founders, um, he's there as support also. So in general, uh, we went over the document that has since gone out to people, the sort of inviting public comment, um, giving some idea for the public to gauge uh, how to best um, uh, give their uh, I, thoughts on what they want in a library um, and the May 1st uh, event. And then there was a lot of talk about how schematic design will happen uh, and then what immediately follows. So there were these four points where you finalize or as the building committee will finalize the schematic design um, and say that is done. And then you get MBLC involved and you know they give kind of a check and then there would be the Amherst historical um, commission committee that would give, give their um, input and then it would go to the mass historical. 
And then once you get all those approvals and any adjustments, then it would move on to that next design phase that Craig was explaining to us. So other than that, that's pretty much what we did. And the next meeting will be again this Friday at 9 a.m. Uh, the 29th. Thank you, Christine. Questions for the design subcommittee? Alex. Um, this is a procedural question. So um, in terms of feedback from members of this committee around design, like I don't know whether it's okay for us to participate as a member, get or as a as a attendee, and then like does it then become a larger meeting if if I speak at the design sub subcommittee meeting or like I just want to procedurally how does that work? That's a good I believe, point. I yeah. believe, but but again, Christine, do you know the answer to that question? I I don't actually. I mean, how we on other committees have been, Alex could come and talk as a regular person. Um, I mean, I guess the common ground is we're both on the building committee, but is it okay if she's coming as a chair of a different committee? The outreach. She'd, and she'd be coming as a as a yeah. member of the public, not as a chair of any other committee. Uh, Angie, do you have an answer to this question? I think we always are on the side of caution. And if we reach a quorum of the whole at a subcommittee meeting, then we post it as both, especially if there's deliberation going on. So um, I think the other way to do it is to, during report the report out here of the subcommittee, to then open it up for full discussion here and avoid that overlap oh, okay. at the subcommittee meeting. Alex, does that help you? It does. So does that mean I can make a comment now? <laughs> it depends on what it is. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Um, I, I just wanted to, to, to um, I, I listened to the design subcommittee meeting. And one thing I wanted to make sure was being addressed is that in the original design work, um, there were gendered bathrooms. And I know back on design and feasibility that I brought up making sure that we have gender-free bathrooms that's in keeping with sort of how things are today. And so I, I just wanna make sure that that didn't get dropped and that's still, that, that it's being addressed as we revise the schematics. Christine. So all I'll say is I think that type of topic will generate discussion as we get further into the details of design. Maybe Craig can answer this. I, I know building code also, in, you know, there's a lot of factors that play into that. Craig, do you have any insight how that will roll out? So one thing that I am aware of is that the, um, the plumbing code does not consider um, gender-free bathrooms within the male and female count, bathroom counts. And so um, if you're required to have eight, an eight, um, the gender-free bathroom would be like a ninth. Um, I, I'm not 100% up to speed on whether or not a, um, a bathroom can be a single stall bathroom if it needs to be identified as one or the other. But um, th this, this is a big topic in the, in the industry. And um, I'm sure Feingold Alexander has um, is, is well versed in it, better versed in it than I am. Um, so yes, that's something that we will discuss with them as the design pro progresses. So that will be down the road, if Alex, if that helps you. I, I think there'll be that and other topics like that that will end up as like specific agenda items that where they'll be better to explain to us and the public the factors that um, are not changeable and that are flexible. There's Alex, are you satisfied with those answers? <laughs> no, <laughs> not really. Good, good, so, so good. Uh, yeah, so when, when we spoke to Feingold Alexander back however many years ago it was, they similarly said what you said, Craig, which I wasn't satisfied with then, right? So Amherst Cinema, our public schools, like all of these places have, I mean, if you go to Amherst Cinema, you can go into whatever bathroom you want, right? Um, and so I know that there's code to contend with, but I'm 
like saying we can't do it or we need, you know, an alternate bathroom, I don't find to be a satisfactory answer. So if in the five years we're working on this, we need to be soliciting our legislators to change the code. Like what, like I, so I don't, I don't want this to be something down the line because the number of bathrooms that we have potentially changes if we have gender-free bathrooms, right? And, and, and treating, you know, a gender-free bathroom as, as an extra is not, in my opinion, universal design and welcoming everybody, right? Um, so the sooner we're having that conversation because it very much impacts the schematics, right? Bathrooms are a big deal. Um, so I don't think it's a later conversation. I think it's the next time we talk to Feingold, like we need to make sure they're on the same page and there's a priority around that. So uh, to me, this is very helpful. And what I try to do at the design meeting is at this point, I'm trying not to get into the weeds too much because I hear your, you know, your passion. I think a lot of people and this, it is, it's being talked about, like Craig said, in a lot of buildings right now. And unfortunately, it's not like crystal clear, but it, there are, there's choice in it. So it, this is part of I think what the public feedback we're, we're so is a I'm just being protective of the design committee a little bit like we I hear you and there's going to be a lot of people who have their points that they feel very passionate about and we're going to have to figure out a way how we compile these and sort of deliver them to the design um, committee to weigh out because it really does come down in the end to the rules and money and and you're right like you know, how much, Craig, again, I'm not sure. I think gender, they're single bathrooms and not like the group. That's sort of what Craig was saying. Like, so it, you're right, it will impact the design. And this is where we have to tell Fe uh, Feingold Alexander, you know, maybe give us some options. What, what are some ways to look at this? Like all gender free newt or part or it, you know, I think it's just about pushing back to them and getting them to give them uh, some options to chew on. Uh, Xander. Xander. Oh, sorry. The trying to balance kid pickup at the same time. Sure. Our smallest patrons also deserve to come home. Um, the, but I just, I wanted to say like, I hear that um, and I want to self-identify like my own uh, triggers around this, right? That like, this is not a point of passion. Like this is a point of our values. And I think that uh, when, when we're non-committal about those things, um, even at this stage, but are willing to commit to the fact that somehow we'll save 20 cents on the dollar uh, because the, that's just the world we live in. Um, it tells us that we are more willing to accept inflation than our patrons, and I, I'm not comfortable with that if one of our uh, central values in this project is going to be inclusivity. So may I just say, Christine, I'm, I'm sorry to just interrupt. I, I frankly think we don't, um, we, I mean, again, with all due respect to Craig, I didn't think that was a helpful answer. So I think the, the helpful thing to say is to say to Craig, uh, we have heard a strong sentiment expressed on the committee. Uh, come back to us, tell us what, what it is that Feingold Alexander is thinking about of gender, for gender inclusive bathrooms. And then we can, we can argue about it. He says, well, you can't do this or that, but I just think right now, what we want to say to Craig or to Michael Alexander is there's a strong sentiment expressed and uh, we'd like you to be responsive to that. And that way we don't have to, you know, argue about whether it's a, a values thing or, or an intent preference thing. Uh, let's get Feingold Alexander on the, on the, on the path of trying to uh, produce gender inclusive bathrooms for this, for this building. And uh, then we'll see what the what the trade offs are and what the codes say and what the rest of it is, Christine. So again, I, I don't want this to come off as that we're fighting or arguing like that's not what's happening. Right. Here. We're hearing a strong 
feeling about something and we'll have lots of these right as soon as we get into the net zero and all the sustainability issues again a lot of passion is going to arise and these it's going to happen over and over again and it's about compromise and we're going to have to figure out i mean a, there's the perfect world and having everything and not and i'm not just talking about the bathrooms i'm talking about everything so what we're asking is for craig to make clear some of and i think some of this is going to have to come across in recommendations or something, Austin, because you can't just, we can't just get all up in passion here and start telling Craig to keep running to them and asking for different things. We sort of have to decide, well, is this something that we feel so strongly about that we're making like a motion or a recommendation? Because we'll keep doing this. I mean, right now it's bathrooms and they're very important, but there's lots of things that as we go through this. So we need to figure out a a good way to handle it. I think what that we need is I think I, I think what we need is more information. That's what I was asking Craig yeah. to to get us. But maybe uh, that goes to design committee. That's what we have to design decide again, or we'll end up having super long meetings that we don't want to be getting to all the weeds. So, Craig, how do you see this going? What would be helpful to you for us to ask you for these things and go to Fine Gold Alexander? So on this particular issue, I will right away uh, alert fine. Well, it I'm not sure if they have already if they're already aware of the town's right. desires or, or the group's desires with this. But if not, I will make sure that that is clear to them. But then I agree with Christine that this is a, a topic that we um, we should discuss in the design subcommittee and then um, bring that bring a recommendation back to this committee. And with all the information, we can even ask Feingold Alexander if it's a uh, particularly complex issue that we want to understand all the, the nuances. We can have them attend one of these meetings and kind of walk us through that. Um, but Great. right now, I'll bring that information um, to find Alexander and get Great. them thinking about it. Great. Anika. Yes, I just wanted to make a suggestion um, to the design committee that it could be helpful to just look overall at design and things like, um, you know, all gender neutral uh, bathrooms that may seem like something to negotiate about. I'm just looking like on a larger scale where they might be newer for this project that kind of overall, these are things that are just kind of commonplace and expected. Um, so maybe just kind of keeping like in mind what, you know, what those things like looking ahead, if there's any way that these are identified so they can be lumped. So it's, you know, the credit is not running back and forth and there's this disconnect and it doesn't turn into an argument because they'll, they'll really be expected. This is going to be a brand new fabulous library and we wouldn't want certain things to seem dated, you know, um, you know, uh, so I think that that could, you know, help to look through that lens of looking ahead and making sure that you know we're in line with not only being inclusive but being up to date alex requested information she said she wanted to make sure this had not been forgotten so let's make sure it hasn't been forgotten so Correct. Craig, after you talk to feingold alexander let's keep that in mind for one of our future uh agendas for the design committee so that we make sure it gets discussed absolutely Great. And just remember what we just heard procedurally. Procedurally, what we heard is that if people have, uh, members of this committee have questions about the design, they're going to ask them in this meeting because of the problem that Angie just alerted us to. So let's just, let's just remember that. I mean, that's what we just were, we were just in, instructed to do. So, okay. Any other any other questions about design? All right, fabulous. Thank you very much, Christine. Outreach. So we haven't had a meeting since the last building committee meeting. That's on me because I was gone. Um, but I do want to push, obviously, our, our May 1 outreach event. Um, that's from 12 to 2. And we are super excited. Um, we, through very generous volunteers um, were able to have our flyer translated into five languages, um, which was great. 
Um, <laughs> we were able to get it out in the superintendent newsletter through all the PGOs, restaurants and local businesses posted it, went out on social media um, and various and, and sundry places. Um, in terms of staffing on the tables, we have, I think over like 22 volunteers in addition to library staff that's coming in. Um, we have, you know, Earl Miller uh, from Cress and Teresa Sadler from the Literacy Project at our social work table. We've got Haley Bolton from the Senior Center in our senior table. We've got Jane Wald from Amherst Historic at our historic table. We've got um, Marty Smith from the Disability Access Advisory Committee for our Universal Design table. Uh, we've got Melinda Reed from UMass uh, Landscape Architecture at our landscape table. And uh, we have um, the local author who did Planeta Blue, which is a, a young adult graphic novel, who's gonna be there hoping to draw in some teens. Um, we have uh, teens who are coming um, and actually are gonna be uh, staffing the teen table to collect feedback and information from other teens. Um, we have Dr. Shabazz and Tweedy and Anika's mom, Deborah Bridges, coming for the special collections table. So we're super excited. Um, we have people who voted in favor of the library project staffing these tables. We have people who voted against the library project staffing these tables. Um, the um, uh, chair of the committee for Save Our Library and Vote No um, very graciously agreed to share um, the flyer and announcement with uh, their entire mailing list. So, um, you know, we've hopefully are going to have a really nice turnout for this event. Um, and it's very much a community based event of community talking to community about their hopes and dreams. We have um, pictures from other libraries that have been renovated and expanded that will be up to sort of spark conversations and ideas, because I think a lot of people don't necessarily know what is happening in libraries these days. And so the idea is that to see something go, oh, wow, yeah, I do want that, or this is what I want um, or hope for. So, um, <coughs> uh, and then we also, oh yeah, we have uh, also Meg Gage and uh, Mary Sayer who are also um, gonna be contributing to the universal design um, table. So um, yeah, I didn't list everybody, but yeah, super excited. So anybody has any questions, hopefully everybody here will come. Um, yeah. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> so we're all allowed, it's posted, we're all allowed to come because I've, I've already said I will come and help because you, um, Alex had said some of her tables could use some more um, people. Um, so that's okay, we can come, it's a posted meeting. Uh, uh, Austin. Angie. Can, it's can, not it's not a posted meeting because there isn't any deliberation going on you're having conversations and you're disseminating information and you're asking for feedback so to my knowledge it's not a posted meeting it's a community event and members shouldn't be talking to members you should be interfacing with the public so i think we're good to roll i can double check that i can run it by council if you'd like me to but i think because you're not talking to each other and because you're not voting on anything, I think you're good to roll. Right. So, and but that yeah. does that does really caution us not to hear an idea and go over to Alex and 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 Sharon and say, you know, th I think this is a really good idea. Right. So I think that's the caution. Um, if you know somebody drops a a, a, a post-it note and you want to go over to Alex and say, you know, I think someone dropped a post-it note, that's fine. But let's not be discussing the ideas that we hear in that venue. Christine? Yeah. No, that's well said. So that's good to clarify because we're new at this and, and it is sensitive. So um, none of us will feel slighted if we're ignoring each other a little. Great. I love that the Open Meetings Act is a great tutorial for high school students at dances. This is why you don't just hang out with your clique in the corner. Okay, other questions about outreach or other suggestions about the outreach event? I Alex, also just want, yeah, I just also want to add that most, if not all, of our town councilors will also be at the event. Um, not at any of the tables. We've suggested that they circulate and listen and participate with community members. Um, so really just trying to make this as, you know, yeah, 
as successful as possible. Terrific. And great thanks to the outreach committee, to Alex and Anika and Xander in particular, and the town staff that has helped um, generate what will be a just fabulous um, event and a great start to a townwide conversation about this great library. Okay, uh, next item is item six, correspondence. I don't have any correspondence. The committee doesn't have any correspondence, so I don't think topics not anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance, uh, nothing. So next would be public comment. We have four members of the public in attendance. Thank you for attending uh, any public comment. Okay, I see no indication of a member of the public wanting to make a comment at this point. Okay. So with great thanks for a very good meeting, a very important meeting, uh, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Good. Okay, Sharon. Uh, agreed. <laughs> yes. A a Anika. <laughs> yes. Sean. Yes. Xander. Yep. Alex. Yes. Christine. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, George. Yes. And Austin, Angie, thank you as always for your indispensable help. Uh, thank you, Craig, for uh, all the work that you're doing. So stay well, everybody. We're adjourned. Thank you.